G'day legends, I hope that you are having a fantastic day and a fantastic weekend. Now, firstly, it is my birthday today, I turned 28, I know that I look 45, but I'm just weathered from everything, and it's definitely not a coincidence that I share a birthday with Chuck Norris, but I did get told in 2018 by an oncologist that I would have about five years left, so I've definitely you know, blown what he has said out of the water and that is due to my brain tumor if you don't know what i'm on about but i just want to firstly say a massive thank you to you guys for everything you've changed my life my career everything so a massive thank you now we do have a fair bit to talk about today we're going to talk about huge air defense losses for ukraine and the impact that this is going to have we have to have a look at what happened in taganrog yes they have the ukrainian drones heading into russia of course we'll look at the maps and we're going to have a look at what the pope has said legends we normally hear we look at the news and we break down the strategies of what is happening on the front line well you can be in the commander's seat and prepare yourself for the ultimate clash of nations in today's video sponsor conflict of nations this is a free pvp strategy game and this will redefine your gaming experiences you'll choose your destiny lead a real country in the chaos of world war three you'll engage in epic real-time battles against up to 128 players that can unfold over weeks and this will test your strategic prowess to the absolute limit you'll navigate the political landscape declare war on your neighbors and forge powerful alliances with other players but ultimately the choice is yours and the fate of the world is in your hands strategize plan and execute your way to victory engage in epic battles capture territories and dominate the world using your own unique strategy and the best part is you can command your forces on both pc and mobile so you can take the action with you wherever you go now claim your exclusive gift by clicking the link in the description you'll get thirteen thousand gold and one month of premium subscription for free your path to global domination starts now now, firstly, where we'll start is here in Tag and Rog. So I'll show you exactly on the map where we're talking about. So, of course, this is Ukraine. This is the capital of Kyiv. The red area is occupied since 2022 and the purple since 2014. Of course, the green areas where Russia has been before, they either have a withdrawal from those areas or have been pushed out. Now, of course, so this is the Black Sea, the Sea of Azov. Then we come down here near Rostov on Don and we see Tag and Rog. Tag and Rog sits a let's have a look oh can i get this thing here we go 120 kilometers ish from the front line but of course we know these will be launched much much further behind the line within the territory of russia and we got footage yesterday coming out as far as this footage here of saying that there were many strikes against tag and rog in the tens of drones and that lasted somewhere between 20 minutes to an hour and a half as far as the mixed varying reporting that I've seen. And you can see clearly here that something has come down. Is this onto fuel? Is it onto a plane? We have no idea exactly what was hit here and you can't geolocate some of this with the amount of blurring. And there were some big claims coming out about what it may have been. Now, I just want to remind everyone that in this war, there's many smartphones a smartphone everywhere everyone has one there's drones there's footage from uh, security cameras and things come out very very quickly regardless of where it is so within 24 48 hours if you don't see something come out i think be careful of claims that are made and i'll say this this it links back to the su-34s that we saw claimed down over the past fortnight that there was no footage come out of the majority of those and nothing has come out that even with the the planes hit within russia russia's ships hit more important targets very quickly very quickly footage comes out and now we're into the next morning forwards and so far nothing really has come out of tag and roll but let's have a look at what is being said so this is from fighter bomber whose track record is very good speaking about russian losses as for the attack on taganrog everything remains unchanged we fought back normally they fell short of the norms partly because they were uh, there were no plans at the factory or at the airfield but in general air defense and electronic warfare are handsome 
Of course, 41 goals is a very, very many. So saying that there were 41 drones or missiles coming in and they were able to hit some of those, maybe the majority, it's not exactly said how many. But what is down here in Tag and Rock? Well, yes, there's an airfield where there are sometimes CAR-52 helicopters, planes, but there is also a uh, scientific research factory, air factory here that they do the modifications on uh, supersonic aircraft such as the uh, TU-160, but also more importantly, the update, the modification for Russia's AWACS. So for the A-52 then, the newer variant of those, and they have been spotted here before. Now, of course, it needs to be noted that this is not far behind the line, that there is equipment being moved in Russia further and further away because of risks like this. Now, we did see on the 29th here, of uh, I believe it's February, we have seen that there is evidence that an A50 has been spotted here, and this is where they do the modification of the vehicles. Now, this is the claims coming out from Ukrainian pages that Taganrog Aviation Plant and the A50 aircraft, which was there for modernization, destroyed by the morning strikes of the armed forces of Ukraine from People's Deputy, the deputy here. So. With this blurry image showing what it's trying to say is some damage to the roof here. But again, there's no evidence of this yet. And I'm sure that there were cameras aboard the drone, some level of that smartphone. If something, it's going to come out. If something was hit, I guarantee in this war, we have footage of absolutely everything comes out. Now, there are some uh, more bits of footage, I guess, from satellites here. So we have Taganrog on uh, the left here of yesterday. So we see the roof here. We see these three aircraft and no visual signs of damage. Just want to make note, this is where the A-50 was parked in the image from weeks prior. And it does look like, you know, there's been an oil spill or something here. You're going to have bits and pieces like this. So we have then the image of today on the right and yesterday on the left. Now, the first thing I want to point out is there is no noticeable huge damage. Now, what it is saying is here on the roof that this is a display of damage. And yeah, okay, it's not like something has been completely taken out here. And that he's saying that on this corner that there is damage here as well. And you can see that there is some like shrapnel that has come off here as well. But as far as massive noticeable damage, no, this could be um, uh, bits and pieces falling off intercepted drones or missiles as well. So nothing, it's not like everything's flattened in here and these aircraft that are sitting out in the open seem to be untouched by that. And if we line up where this claimed photograph was, they're pointing at the same location as this. But again, this isn't like mass damage. You can see dug in areas around this and this airfield is protected by air defense as well. So confirmation on something there no definitely not at all currently but what we need to look at right now is the claims of huge air defense losses in ukraine and saying that russian iskander missiles for the first time have taken out two patriot launches now it needs to be noted these are the launches not the entire systems that the radars are incredibly important as well so let's have a look at the footage of this. Now, this was actually originally reported as S-300 systems, but both sides, which I have seen, at least online, have really widely accepted that this actually is Patriot launches. And we will then look at where people are saying the evidence of this is. So we can see these are the vehicles moving down here. You can see a very large explosion. So this is more what we'd expect from an Iskander missile, different to what we saw when the HIMARS system was hit earlier uh, this week or last week now uh, with the uh, tornado. It's more of that air burst down, nowhere near the size of an Iskander. And this is more what we'd expect from an Iskander hit here as well. It's very obvious when you hit air defense launches, you get this sort of uh, firework effect from them. So very, very large bang in here and we have more footage then zoomed out we're going to talk about the recon how this was hit everything over this now how do we how do we know what this is well 
it's always very, very difficult. But like I say, when both sides are sort of accepting it, we get a better idea. And these are some of the photographs they are lining up around where then the stabilizers on the side of the launchers fit, as well as the shape of the door on the Patriot system. So we'll see here. Now you need to remember too that these Patriots, these are on a man truck chassis. Very surprised that the Western Armies and the Australian Army went with a truck named Man. I thought that'd be the they them trucks in this day and age in our militaries, but at the end of the day, it's on this chassis. So something like the door isn't necessarily saying that it's then 100% a Patriot launcher, but it it things line up and people are accepting that they have lost two Patriot launchers in here. Now, and have a look over then the aftermath of this attack. So you can see very, very large hit here. And this was the VO first claiming that these were S300s, but has been rolled back on. Actually, no, these were a far more important system. So let me just delete these because I'll end up getting bloody confused. Where did this then actually go down? So we'll come in onto Donetsk Oblast here. We'll have a look for then Avdivka. Now, where we find is Pokrovsk here, and then we see Sirhivka. So this is where at least Rybar is claiming that this was hit. So just near Sirhivka, and we see this is out then towards Avdivka. So let's just give this a measurement of as far as how far this actually then is. So Pokrovsk, Sirhivka. Now this is going to be very, very rough, but we're talking a minimum of 55 kilometers behind the line. Of course, these are scanned missile systems are going to be well, well further back, but of course have a much longer range than that as well. Now, it has been a very catastrophic week for air defense in Ukraine. It absolutely has been, and they've had major losses, and it does seem that some things have changed in the air. So we saw the Iskander missile land apparently within hundreds of meters or a few kilometers from Zelensky in Odessa this week. Of course, Odessa has a lot of air defense, but we also saw the increase in the recon drones there as well. We saw the HIMARS system taken out by, we presume, a Tornado Air. Some reported an Iskander. We also saw that they had then reconnaissance drones there tens of kilometers behind the front line and sending back live feed high quality images so there does seem to be a huge freedom of movement for russian reconnaissance drones in the air then we have a look at areas around avdivka we look at bakhmut places like this it does seem like there is even more freedom of movement for the russian aircraft dropping then the fab bombs as well and this is a big concern for the defense of Ukraine around the freedom that Russia is seemingly to improve in the air. Now, I will say with these, these are the launchers. Now, the radar is the more important piece of these. How can this system, this uh, reconnaissance drone, actually film these where they were? Well, radar is not on all the time because of anti-radiation missiles and the targeting of the system but the radar is very important, but not to downplay that the missiles are also incredibly important. If you're tracking down where the missiles are, well, sooner rather than later, you're then going to find then the radar systems as well. These are in very limited amounts and a very, very expensive system. So any loss here does have a big impact on Ukraine's air defense. And like I've said, this past week or two has had very catastrophic air defense losses for Ukraine. So we have a video here that just goes over some of these. It's a bit of a, a compilation of hits against systems. And we'll talk about some of these systems that were then hit. The, the book... And this ties into what I was saying before, that it does seem like there is being more and more success with the targeting of these systems and the freedom of these reconnaissance drones that Russia is having. And of course, this is the final video here that we just looked at, said to be the S-300s, but many are claiming now on both sides that it's not. It's actually that. We had this video yesterday of uh, NASAM being hit as well. Of course, a very important air defense system. This is the radar in the center. And then there was a frag from a shrapnel from a, uh, 
a strike in here as well. And again, the freedom seemingly of then the reconnaissance drones in the air. Now, this is a quick list of what is said to be taken out. P-18, S-300, P-18 radar, NASAM launcher, S-300 book, book battery, S-300 launcher, P-18 radar, ST-68U radar. So these P-18s and the ST, these are Soviet-era stuff, and two Patriot launchers up there today. And some will say it's actually more than that, but at least as far as I'm aware, that's the visually confirmed stuff. So it could be also, and it's not out of the realm, that this footage of like the um, Patriots, the HIMARS, is like accumulated footage being sort of held. And once something, once they need a propaganda win, then it can be released. This could happen. So say when we saw uh, the ship taken out in the Black Sea, the next day we saw the HIMARS taken out. Maybe that footage is being held for an amount of time when something bad happens and we'll release this to try and flood out the propaganda informational space. But there is no question that air defense is the most important aspect of Ukraine's entire defense. If Russia was allowed freedom of air movement, the tide of the war would change within hours or days. Russia has lost a lot of aircraft. Russia has still the majority of their aircraft sitting in Russia and a lot of them still able to come in. Russia has not lost the majority of its air power. The problem is Russia is having a problem getting that air power actually into theatre with the threat of air defence. But if Russia was able to get air superiority in the sky, or at least the massive advantage in dominance over these areas, it would change the tide of the war incredibly quickly it would go from these glide bomb attacks 60 70 kilometers behind the line to carpet bombing of aircraft with a lot of freedom of movement it would it would change greatly and the support of tanks and infantry on the ground would be far far superior if there was air defense capability like for russia ukraine's main thing is they need to hold off that air power that russia still has and the air defense has been doing a really good job at this but we are seeing more of these ad systems not only taken out but then we're seeing more movements of these drones these russian drones and planes within ukrainian airspace as well and this all ties into what countries like the us were saying about the f-16 aircraft that they were adamant that what is more important for ukraine is a focus on these air defense systems rather than f-16s and and this is something we're seeing evolving, I believe, very quickly. If you listen to me uh, a little bit, you'll hear me over the past two weeks saying that it just seems like there is a increase, a further increase in Russia's air power in Ukraine. It, it just seems like there's more freedom of movement of these Sioux aircraft. There's more claims of them being shot down with little evidence. We see a lot of fabs dropping. We're seeing more of these recon drones. And I think this is a big concern of this defense. Now, will the F-16s roll in and change the tide instantly? absolutely not there is always a teething phase with any new system so with the new tanks let's look at the leopards let's look at the bradleys it took really a good 12 months or just under 12 months to be able to use these more proficiently these are a far 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 more simple item than something like a fighter jet many of the stuff that i've read has said yes it will take 18 months to get them into ukraine which is you know we're getting to that very soon but it will take years to actually be proficient on the ground with these the teething phase so expect to see some losses in the beginning just because you see losses doesn't mean that then everything is losing but expect to see some losses and the proficiency may increase here now does this say to us with this that there's maybe something new in the air flying around now my friend of mine who will remain unnamed, has sort of spoken about this with regards to the HIMARS. Both systems are rumoured to have hit the HIMARS, the Ostgander and Tornado have something in common. As far as public knowledge goes, so public knowledge, it may actually do this, but they can only fire a GPS, GLONASS. GLONASS is like the Russian version of GPS, guided missiles with potentially of a bit of optical guidance in the terminal phase. So once it starts coming down, a bit of optical guidance, this is the same as a Javelin missile does. This means that they can only hit static targets or targets that may that only move a little bit between the launch and impact, thanks to the terminal guidance through optics. So as it's coming back down, if the vehicle's moving a little bit, it can still, okay, this is what it looks like, and hit it, otherwise aiming for static targets. Now, he gives three lists of how he thinks the HIMARS may have been hit, from breaking down to poor tactics and then maybe a new weapon system. So the HIMARS wasn't hit with an ice scanner or tornado, but with a laser-guided weapon. 
Uh, this would be suited to, to a moving target, though it wasn't moving at the time of the hit. And the presence of Russian drone in the vicinity, evidenced by the fact that we have footage, we also have footage of them, the Patriots, suggests it's possible because the drone uh, could have been designated, uh, could have designated the target. So the drone has painted it with a laser and then a laser system has hit it. Uh, and, but then what drone would this be? Of what was the vector for the weapon? In fact, what was the weapon? The Orland 30 is supposed to have laser designator, but I'm unaware of a Russian system that could carry laser-guided munitions this far from the front line, except, of course, for a fighter jet. But I doubt they'd risk it. Could be some new drone that we don't know about. But if there's more freedom of movement in the air. Maybe it was something off a fighter jet as far as laser designator, or maybe we're seeing a new system in play. Not 100% sure, but we're going to have a look at a new system that is in play currently now we have this or i think option a which was the broke down uh but option b would indicate notable improvement from the russian forces but option c would mean they've had made a huge leap ahead and are now capable of doing things until now only nato seemed capable of including the turks with the tb2 drones it would mean that they slipped all of this through ukraine's air defenses which we're seeing more this is seemingly to add up but we know for sure that was the case for at least the observation drone providing footage. But it looks like in this new footage, there's maybe two observation drones. This would spell real trouble for the Ukrainians, but I doubt it. That said, I think they'll get there eventually, and Ukraine had better figure out something before they do. Saying that, I'm sure they'll get there with these laser-designated weapons being able to actually move and control in the air at real time. And that saying this, and this guy's very knowledgeable, they better figure out something before they do. Maybe this has been figured out. Now we're going to have a new drone and new bomb. So the British MOD has released this. The Mohajar A6 is an Iranian-produced uncrewed aerial vehicle drone provided to Russia and observed flying over the Black Sea in Crimea. These drones is, is an ISR target acquisition reconnaissance system, but only can conduct air-to-surface attacks with free-fall guided munitions. So it sees it, and then a free-fall guided munition, like a FAB, comes in and hits it. This is what their intel is saying. Its practical range is limited by line of sight to maintain real-time operator control, same as like FPV drones or uh, DJI drones, their line of sight, approximately 200 kilometres at 10,000 feet. This can be extended by hand over to another ground terminal, so you're like linking them together. The continued presence of the system in Western Crimea is likely evidenced of Russia trying to identify threats to Russian ports and vessels following recent Ukrainian successes. There is a realistic possibility its mission also includes supporting Russian targeting processes for southwest Ukrainian coastline. Uh, Ukraine has shot down at least one on 23rd of December. The Black Sea and Russia has actually apparently shot one down as well. And we have some images that they have released of this. So this is this new drone and then the ground control station here. So there is a new drone in play. Now, something I should have spoken about is Pokrovsk up here, Sohivka. This is where, where my cursor is, where we have seen... If I click here, this is right where we've seen that that drone, uh, sorry, the Patriot system was hit. Now, of course, if we draw a dot, like it's just here. Now, maybe this is supplying some air support for the areas around here. Now, of course, this is a very, very important area for Avdivka and, of course, down here for attacks, say, in Taganrog or attacks into the Sea of Azov in this vicinity. I'm saying yeah, this is a mobile system. They can move of where we've seen things like the A-50 shot down. So this system, you know, makes sense to be in this area, but this area seems to be under more control. Now we're going to speak about a new bomb that is coming out. There's very limited knowledge. We spoke about this a little bit yesterday, but I think that I did get some bits and pieces wrong. So this is the UMPB bomb. So this is what then uh, fighter bomber, I believe, says about it. The new 250 caliber round bomb arrived at Ukraine positions for the first time. This is it on the ground here. The bomb is equipped with a planning and correction module. Now, I don't have, I'll put up the photo here if I don't. You can see where you can actually put in the planning and corrections into this bomb. And this ties back to what my mate, that my Intel guy was saying about there seems to be a new system. The many reports. The product contains a warhead, one 250 kilograms, a missile launcher, and allegedly an outboard turbojet engine and a fuel tank. So it can launch out of something and then sit as like a loitering munition and come back down. This shown, Aerobomb, is indeed not similar to any of the previously encountered Russian guided bombs, except perhaps the vaguely to the UPAB-50 and 100 from this company for Orion reconnaissance and attack UAVs, but the mass of the Aerobomb cast doubt on equipping a drone with it. The name of the UMPB was also not previously recorded. It can be assured that letter B, 
the end means loitering. So we have a little bit more information. So we see this photograph here, which Fire Bomber had shared. And as we can see, little wings on it to give it a lot more range as well, saying the turbojet engine, as well as the launch engine. We can see the one that came down in Ukraine. We can see the wings here and where this engine sits. It's looking like it, it mixes like your uh, multiple, multiple launch rocket system and sort of a glide bomb in one. Now, this is a little bit of information to take this with a grain of salt, but photos of the previously unknown of Wunderwaffen, of course, a wonder weapon that Germans always tried to find and never did, appeared this product is positioned for 300 millimetre MLRIs, theoretically like the Smirch or same thing, the Tornado S. Tornado S is what most likely was what took out the HIMARS system, so note that. It is uh, assumed that some of the elements of the Tornado missiles are used in this product. Very, This is probably known. Uh, any any systems, whether it's Russian, West, Chinese, whatever, there's a lot of stuff shared across. And we have uh, infantry fighting vehicles and uh, other vehicles that share like 90% of parts. It's just the way it is. But anyway, despite this, it is launched from an airplane since the bomb has a pylon attachment. So that we see that this can be apparently here launched then from an airplane and works to give extra range and loiter as well, but also maybe fire from one of these systems. But all I'm trying to all I'm trying to say is we know that there's apparently new drones in the sky. There's apparently new bombs dropping, and we're seeing more success against targets on the ground. And I'm just laying that out there, and you guys can do what you want with that given information. So that's about Tag uh, Tag and Rog and bloody the Patriot system. Now, I just want to show you this quick video. We're seeing then this release by Chinese state media, this bloke, headset, FPV, drone, and uh, controller here. And we are seeing, of course, we assumed this, but that the Chinese are practicing against targets with FPV drones in against tanks, trench systems like this. And this is what we're seeing is incredibly successful in Ukraine for the Ukrainians and for the Russians. And this will get developed across many, many countries. And this is going to be a huge problem in any further conflict, not only against superpowers or other countries, but against terrorist organizations, because these are incredibly, incredibly cheap. They're easy to make, easy to learn. You can just learn on a computer and any computer how to fly one of these. And these are going to be a huge problem in the future of any warfare. Now we have very, very little map updates today. The only change on the deep state is we come up in here near Tabayevka, where we saw that Ukraine had some blue, so it made ground within two weeks, that this has just changed to green. So now it's over two weeks. But as far as change on the front line, I'm not seeing anything. Now, Syriac has one update here. Speaking about the defensive works being built using um, the maps made by Clement Molin on the Ukrainian positions. Now, Clement, of course, just uses anything that is publicly available, geolocates it and puts the trenches down, although has had many, many th uh, threats against him uh, from people that don't like this. But here we see this map here. So we can see this is Ukraine sitting in here. These are the defensive likes. And you can see, I know this isn't the greatest layout in the world, but you can see where the blue dots are and the red. This is sitting where the Ukrainian defensive works are and the blue through here. These are the Russian defensive line and this green, this is where the current front line is sitting. So you can see that both Russia, of course, have had their massive build up through the last couple of years and that Ukraine is starting to build more of these defensive works. But Ukraine troops have been building a huge trench system in the Donbass area under their control of northern Zaporizhia uh, and in the near future in eastern, eastern Dnipro. Our Russian advance in this area will not be easy or quick. It is uh, it is impossible for a collapse to happen in this situation. This is exactly the opposite or the exactly the same, depending on how you look at it, as the Russian defensive works last year, that it's not quick or easy to move through, and you're not just going to see a total collapse in this. As Ukraine troops will be able to withdraw systematically as Russian forces advanced westward. So as Russia moves forward, Ru Ukraine will just be able to pepper pot rearwards and rids to more beefed up, lines and just wear them down. The exact same thing we saw happen in the multiple lines of defense in the south on the counteroffensive. As previously mentioned, the Ukrainian collapse will occur when there is a tipping point for the resource reserves available to the Ukrainian state. Now, this is where the tipping point in this war will happen, is when either Russia or Ukraine don't have the manpower or resources to continue the war. So what I've spoken about before, that I believe the longer this goes on, that we're just going to end up with a front line 
that is not fluid, defensive works that are impassable to anyone. And of course, every day that goes on, the defensive works just get stronger. The defensive works are not getting weaker and neither Russia or Ukraine will be able to break through those. And we're going to end up with like a demilitarized sort of zone in there. I could be wrong, but that is just how it's sort of looking to me. Now, the UK Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, in an interview with the German media outlet, has opposed any deployment of Western troops to Ukraine, saying we must avoid creating obvious targets for Putin. So, of course, if they went into train or to demine, this would be a target that, of course, massive target on the head here. Now, this all came after it was revealed that a small number of British military personnel are in Ukraine, of course, helping with targeting primarily of the Storm Show Scout, but other stuff as well. And as French President Macron has floated the idea of deploying NATO soldiers into Ukraine. And he said for demining, not for combat operations, but we're not really sure. For training Ukrainian soldiers, doing it in Ukraine just makes no sense. It may if we're on a war in Australia where we're so far from anything, but look at Ukraine's neighbours. You could Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, Romania. These are all NATO countries. Just Go out of here into absolute safety. Don't be worried about having air defense or anything else. Move the soldiers out a couple hundred kilometers. Train them back in. It doesn't make sense to go into Ukraine to train. It's not. It, it's Europe. Everything is tiny. There are people in Australia with driveways longer than this. Take the soldiers out into safety uh, in better conditions. Feed them bloody. Train them properly in proper areas where you're not worried about air attacks or other assaults and then send them back in it. It's silly to try and deploy people into Ukraine, except for maybe some small contract things or NGOs to train right near the front. But of large, when you're talking thousands or tens of thousands, it makes sense to move out into other areas and then back in. Now, we're going to talk about what the Pope has said, and this has become very unpopular or popular internet, depending on what side you're in. Now, I just want to point out there that I am not religious, but as I've become more mature and older, especially today, I'm a year older, but I do respect more and more how important religious is on humans around the world and how societies are shaped around this as well as many people's moral compass, which sometimes I have a problem with. But I will never turn a blind eye towards the bad that religion also has in the world. And I think that Hitchin says it best, he said, religion makes otherwise normal people do wicked and disgusting things. Now, there's, of course, very good and very bad that comes with just religion as a whole. And that is my um, sort of take on it. Of course, some are in different <laughs> variables of this across time as well. But this has been going around of the Pope everywhere, of course, wearing a Russian flag as his outfit here. And of course, people yeah, putting this at his basically Putin's mate. But let's actually have a look at what has been said. Now, this was off the... Uh, Vatican's like website. I think it's their official website, but it was like uh, newsvatican dots whatever. So I don't know. Just take it as this. And this these quotes line up with everything else that I've seen. So saying negotiations are never a surrender. It is the courage to not carry a country to suicide. Speaking about peace talks, the Pope urged parties to the war in Ukraine not be ashamed to negotiate before things get worse. The word negotiate is a courageous word. When you see that you are defeated, the things are not going well, it is necessary to have the courage to negotiate. You may feel ashamed, but with how many deaths will it end? Negotiate in time. Look for a country that can mediate. Today, for example, in the war in Ukraine, there are many who want to mediate. Turkey has offered itself for this and others. Do not be ashamed to negotiate before things get worse. Now, I'm not saying I agree with the Pope here, but what I am saying is, Things are going to get worse in this war before they get better for both Russia and Ukraine. Wherever this war leads, that if Ukraine have their aspirational goal to push down into Crimea through these routes, then there is going to be huge losses doing that. There's not, it, it's impossible not to. If Russia want to continue their goal and get to areas like Dnipro, Kiev, Kharkiv, there's going to be absolutely massive losses doing that. Also, I've said many, many times that. By the end of this war, we will see more than a million uh, people killed in this. And when is the right time to negotiate when this is what the what the Pope is talking about? When is the right time to negotiate, especially when things aren't going well? And right now in Ukraine, with the losses we're seeing, with the money stuck in the US, you'd be a brave man to say hand on heart that things are going well. There are 
problems going on. There is a manpower shortage. There's a training shortage. There is a money shortage. I think a lot of this is going to lever on that American money. If that American money doesn't go forward, I think Ukraine need to really have a look inwards and go, what is actually the next step here, especially with we see the, the uh, favourites in the presidential campaign currently. War is always a human defeat, not a geographic one. And this is something I do, I think, with everywhere that I go, that I any country I've been to in the world, that 99% of, pe of people are good, and this is a failure of humanity. And I think this guy summed it up well, that war remains the decisive human failure. Now, the Pope continues here, that war is the power of darkness. There are some who say it's true we must defend ourselves. But then you realise they have a factory that produces aeroplanes to bomb others. Defends ourselves? Defend ourselves? No. Destroy? How does a war end? With death, destruction, and children without parents. So leaning into here about a little bit of that war is a racket. And as we know, war is the best business in the world for people that are in the business of war. If you're in the business of war, making weapons, being a YouTuber, at reporting on war, that war is the best thing to happen for business. And do not think for a minute there aren't people making tens, hundreds, billions, or tens of millions, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars off this war in places that sit in political power to make decisions on this. He noted there's always a geographical or historical situation that provoke war, leading a conclusion that war seems just based on practical motives. But behind every war, there is an arms industry, and this means money. War, said Pope Francis, is darkness and the power of darkness. So what do you think about what the Pope has said? Now, I don't think it's time for Ukraine to give up, but I think there are things coming up very quickly that may have a huge effect on where this war actually goes and how much do you throw into something and how much do you risk before you then look at a negotiation in this. And and I'm um, serious, if you've watched this far, then you obviously don't hate me, but I've said before that currently Russia occupy about 20% of Ukraine. Ukraine still has all this land. I agree that I think this is Ukraine's right to have this area, but is it worth risking the other 80% of this for this? If we do see that there is a massive uh, problem for funding coming into Ukraine from the US, if we see that Russia is increasing power, where does this actually go? And as well for Russia, you only occupy 20%. Is it worth risking the rest of the Russian Federation for a sliver of another country here? I don't know. These are decisions which I am glad that I don't have to make. But there are tens, hundreds of thousands of people losing their lives in this war, controlled by figureheads who couldn't really care less about the individual, but over grand ideas. Legends, thank you for all the birthday wishes. Look after yourselves. If you'd like to support me, the link's down below. But I'll speak to you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Legends, we normally hear, we look at the news and we break down the strategies of what is happening on the front line. Well, you can be in the commander's seat and prepare yourself for the ultimate clash of nations in today's video sponsor, Conflict of Nations. This is a free PvP strategy game and this will redefine your gaming experiences. You'll choose your destiny, lead a real country in the chaos of World War III. You'll engage in epic real-time battles against up to 128 players that can unfold over weeks, and this will test your strategic prowess to the absolute limit. You'll navigate the political landscape, declare war on your neighbours, and forge powerful alliances with other players. But ultimately, the choice is yours, and the fate of the world is in your hands. Strategize, plan, and execute your way to victory. Engage in epic battles, capture territories, and dominate the world using your own unique strategy. And the best part is you can command your forces on both PC and mobile, so you can take the action with you wherever you go. Now claim your exclusive gift by clicking the link in the description. You'll get 13,000 gold and one month of premium subscription for free. Your path to global domination starts now.